is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, Professor Charles Mock is a trauma surgeon who also has a PhD in epidemiology. From 2005 to 2007, he was the director of the Harborview Injury Prevention uh, and Research Center here at the University of Washington. And during this time, he established several injury control training fellowships for young professionals for low and middle income countries. And it's a real pleasure to welcome him tonight for an interesting lecture on a wonderful global health topic confronting the global burden of injuries and violence and the provocative subtitle, Achieving the Intolerable. So welcome, Professor Mock. Well, uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation to speak. I'm uh, very honored, and thank you all for coming at this uh, late hour. Um, in my talk today, uh, I have a few uh, goals. Uh, I would like to convince you that injuries uh, are a big uh, global health problem and that much can be done to lower the burden of death and disability and suffering that injuries cause and that this can be done through very feasible and low cost and sustainable means, including both injury prevention, such as road safety, and improving care for injured persons, such as, which is called trauma care. And I'll leave it to you to wonder until near the end about what we might mean by achieving the intolerable. Uh, much of what I have to say has been influenced by my own experiences, and this includes four years working as a surgeon in Ghana in West Africa, uh, including two years each in a rural and an urban area, a rural area in a town called Brekhoum and a rural province called Brang Ahafu. And uh, the thousand bed Kampfornachi Teaching Hospital in Kumasi, Ghana. Uh, and I know that several uh, medical students uh, each year from UW uh, rotate there. Anybody here ever been to CATH, Kampfornachi Teaching Hospital? Ah, so I can say whatever I feel like saying. And <laughs> no, one, no one can contradict me. Uh, I also um, will be making reference to my work at WHO, where I was away on sabbatical for the past uh, three and a half years. Uh, and this uh, is the WHO headquarters in Geneva and my office on the sixth uh, floor. Uh, I know some people have been there, so I can't get away with too many lies about WHO. Um, in the talk, I'd like to go over a few uh, uh, facts and figures about the extent of the injury problem, and then mostly talk about ways to uh, handle it uh, through injury prevention and through care of injured persons, and then wrap up with some conclusions, and hopefully have some time for questions and answers and debate. Well, first, Injuries are a huge health problem. They account for about 10% of all deaths globally. That's about 5.8 million deaths per year, more than the total number of deaths from HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. And I certainly don't want to, to get into playing my disease is more important than yours. Uh, all of these uh, are major health problems uh, and all deserve uh, the attention that they're getting and more. There is a misperception that injuries are uh, mostly a problem of developed countries, where in, in fact the converse is true. 90% of all injury deaths occur in low and middle income countries, uh, and rates of death are higher uh, than in industrialized countries. This slide shows injury related deaths uh, per 100,000 persons in different regions, and the lowest rates, 40 to 70 deaths per 100,000 per year, lowest rates are in the high income countries, North America, Western Europe, Australia, and China, which has less of an injury problem than most other developing countries. Higher rates in Latin America, Middle East, even higher rates in Africa and Southern Asia, and then the highest rates of injury in the world in the low and middle income countries that comprise the former Soviet bloc. About a fourth of all injuries are due to road traffic crashes. This is the single biggest cause. The next biggest group taken together are intentional injuries, everything else uh, being considered unintentional injuries, that means you know, accidents, for example, uh, or as intentional injuries when people set out to harm themselves or others, constitute about a fourth, whether homicide or suicide, and then a variety of other mechanisms, uh, fires, falls, uh, and many miscellaneous uh, add up to the total of 5.8 million deaths per year from injury. And the situation appears to be getting worse. This shows the uh, uh, ca various causes of death globally ranked by their uh, uh, relative numbers. And uh, the uh, injury-related causes, the main three, are all anticipated to get worse in coming decades in terms of their relative ranking. And in addition uh, to deaths, injuries cause a tremendous amount of disability, both permanent and uh, temporary, and 
uh, economic losses due to cost of treatment and um, lost wages and productivity by the injured persons. Despite this burden, injury is pathetically neglected. One example of the measure of this neglect is W.A. Jones' own budget. Uh, and uh, you can see here the uh, main categories of diseases uh, with their contribution to overall injury, uh, overall burden, uh, disability adjusted life years lost. Uh, and injuries account for about 12% of the overall global burden of disease. Um, and uh, however, uh, they account for less than 1% of WHO's budget, uh, whether looked at the uh, regular funding or the extra budgetary from, from grants and contracts. And you would see similar statistics if you looked at other measures of investment in global health problems, such as international philanthropy or bilateral assistance. In part, this neglect is due to a misperception that little can to be done to prevent injuries, they're, that they're due to accidents or bad luck, and what can you do to prevent them? Well, you can do a lot. Most industrialized countries have considerably decreased their rates of injury death from most of the major causes over the past few decades. As just one example of this, I show here trends in motor vehicle deaths in the United States in the past 100 years. And you can see that in the early part of the century after the invention of the automobile, we rapidly got to work killing ourselves with it. And uh, uh, with rates of death peaking at 30 deaths per 100,000 per year in the 1930s, by which time it had become the major killer, uh, the leading killer of older children and working aged adults in the United States. And slowly, gradually, painfully, with a lot of work by a lot of people, it's been brought down to some of the lowest rates since the 1920s. Still one of our major health problems, still the leading killer of older children and working aged adults, but still some progress. Uh, and uh, we're very proud at the Injury Center uh, here uh, to think that we've played some role in Washington State being one of the safest states in the country with rates considerably lower than the rest of the country. There's a few states that beat us, but we're one of the safest. Uh, and some, most other industrialized countries have similar success stories to report for road traffic and other forms of, of injury. This has been achieved by better application of the spectrum of injury control, research and surveillance to under, better understand the extent and nature of the problem, injury prevention such as road safety and prevention for other types of injuries, and improve care for injured persons, pre-hospital and in, this, in hospital itself. It is eminently feasible to undertake improvements at all points along the spectrum in most countries worldwide, uh, countries at all economic levels. Now, I'll first address injury prevention uh, and then trauma care. In this, I'll be giving examples from the work of myself and my colleagues from several different countries and work from many other groups globally. First, in terms of injury prevention. Injury prevention is often misunderstood as being merely admonitions to be careful. However, <laughs> it is a scientific field like that used to approach any other health problem. It undertakes research into what causes injuries, risk factors. It develops programs that really do target those risk factors and then rigorously evaluates the results to know what's been working and hence should be continued and invested in and what's not working and which should be abandoned and resources shifted elsewhere. Injury uh, prevention uh, can be, injury prevention techniques can be utilized for almost any form of injury I show here the two main categories, many different subcategories of unintentional injuries, uh, and which could also be called accidental, though in the injury field we tend not to use the word accidental because it implies that you can't do anything about it, um, and intentional injuries. We often speak of the three main modalities of injury prevention, and I'll be referring to these throughout the rest of the talk, the three E's, engineering, enforcement, and education. Engineering, making products such as vehicles safer. Enforcement and legislation, laws against drunk driving or speeding. And education, social marketing to promote safe behaviors like promoting helmet use or seatbelt use. Injury prevention work is strongly interdisciplinary uh, with involvement of people from almost any, uh, from many different backgrounds and walks of life, public health practitioners, clinicians of uh, many different specialties, media, advertising, psychologists who work on really trying to accomplish effective behavior change, engineers who work on developing safer products, lawyers and police who uh, promote uh, safety-related law enforcement, 
and many others, and with a critical role for victims and families for advocacy to accomplish much of the legislation and law enforcement. I would like to go into a little detail about confronting the major injury problem that is road traffic crashes. And road safety involves three main spheres of activity, roadway design, vehicle design and maintenance, and many human factors. And I'll say a few words about each one. A major contributor to road safety is the constantly evolving process of identifying and correcting dangerous sections of roadway. For example, you see here two dangerous, road two dangerous roadside rigid objects these uh, concrete or steel post. Uh, one is the, is the exit for Harborview from I-5, and the other is the exit for the Tech de Monterey School of Medicine. Uh, uh, both are by high-speed highways, and in both cases, if a vehicle were to strike these rigid objects going 50 or 60 miles an hour, they either this concrete barrier or this steel pole, uh, there'd be a high likelihood of serious injury or death to the occupants of the vehicle. By placing an energy-absorbing barrier in front of the uh, object, um, this absorbs energy, decreasing the likelihood. So if a vehicle uh, strikes this, it provides ride-down, uh, dis uh, dispersion of the kinetic energy, so less kinetic energy is imparted to the occupants of the vehicle, thus decreasing the likelihood of a crash. This is just one example of many things that go into a, a road, road safety engineering. And much of road safety involves converting situations like this in Mexico to situations like this in Seattle. And although these devices can be expensive, low-cost alternatives are possible and easily arranged for many circumstances. For example, the chief of police in Monterey a few years ago, Alejandro Herrera, went on a campaign to identify uh, the highest risk roadside barrier or roadside objects that vehicles were striking with resulting fatalities in Monterey and uh, uh, corrected these uh, dangerous areas with easily arranged water-filled plastic barrels, uh, low cost, and uh, with the result that fatal crashes at these sites decreased uh, significantly. Another aspect of road safety is safety features built into vehicles, vehicle engineering. There are many such features. I'll just give one example here. Uh, in auto safety, um, much of the advancements in the past few decades have involved front-end collisions, uh, collapsible steering columns, seat belts are mainly designed to protect, protect you in a frontal crash, airbags. A weak link in the chain had been side impact collisions. That is, that until recently, the only thing that protected you if another car was to hit you on the side, a T-bone collision, the only thing that protected you was a relatively thin sheet of, uh, of sheet metal. And, and hence, uh, pictures like this were very common. And you can see this uh, intrusion of the vehicle door because another car hit it. And each of these is five centimeters. So you'll see that, this, that at uh, this point where the uh, driver would be sitting, uh, there's about 30 to 40 centimeters of intrusion, a very high likelihood of serious injury to this uh, driver. This uh, has now been mostly corrected uh, with a requirement by the National Highway Fa Traffic Safety Administration that vehicles contain devices, vehicle doors, contain devices such as these steel bars that reinforce the door, preventing intrusion. And you can see in a similar type crash to what I showed before, there's only about uh, uh, seven to eight centimeters of intrusion here, a much, more, uh, a much safer situation for the driver. So much of vehicle engineering involves converting situations like this into situations like this. But what relevance is this to most countries in the world, especially low-income countries. Most low-income countries, in Africa especially, don't manufacture their own vehicles. They are at the mercy of the safety standards set by, uh, by high-income and some middle-income countries from which they import vehicles, usually used, usually 10, 20, 30 years old. And in such circumstances, uh, maintenance, especially of large commercial vehicles, becomes uh, an important issue. In Ghana, most transports provided by taxis and minibuses such as this, some very old with very limited um, maintenance, in a collaborative study with the Kampfunachi uh, um, Teaching Hospital, focus group discussions were carried out with commercial drivers such as these uh, gentlemen, uh, and it revealed uh, their concerns about the availability of safety-related spare parts like tires and brake components. For example, due to the high cost of hydraulic brake fluid, 
many of these drivers used a soap and water mixture in their brake linings. And you can only imagine how this might affect stopping distances for the vehicles, how it affects safety and the risk of a fatal crash for the many people riding in these vehicles around the world. And all of this has policy implications. For example, would measures to increase the availability of safety-related spare parts, such as brakes or brake fluid or tires, would this be a useful policy? This has scarcely been touched. In some cases, this would be easy to achieve, such as by lowering import duties, as is done with other health-related uh, imports, for example, bed nets. And a long list of human behavioral factors also contribute to road traffic crashes. I'll specifically mention two of the big ones, alcohol and speeding. Drunk driving has been a major uh, risk factor in high-income countries, and it accounts for about a third of all fatal crashes. Anti-drunk driving campaigns have been a cornerstone of road safety efforts in industrialized countries. To what extent should drunk driving, uh, does, does drunk driving contribute to uh, crashes in low- and middle-income countries? To what extent should scarce resources be used for anti-drunk driving work? There's a lot of anecdotes about this. But in order to answer the question better for one locale, several groups collaborated to undertake what is still the largest random roadside breathalyzer survey yet uh, done in Africa. And this used methods for such surveys developed and carried out regularly here in the United States by NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And a group of which I was part uh, tested 722 randomly selected drivers on Ghana's roadways. Uh, my main colleague in this was Dr. Godfried Azima, who is now director of the police hospital in Accra, Ghana. And uh, though I like to think I'm fairly unique uh, being a surgeon with a public health degree, Godfried takes it a step further. He's a policeman with a public health degree. And uh, you see us here at the uh, start of the project uh, with the handheld alcohol sensor breathalyzers, making sure that they're well calibrated. Uh, well, the results of the study were somewhat frightening. Um, one slice of the data looked at uh, the percent of drivers with blood alcohol concentrations of greater than uh, 0 0.1 gram percent. This can also be expressed as 100 milligrams percent, so you may be used to hearing blood alcohol concentrations in either point something or other or in the 80 to 100 range. Well, so this cutoff is a bit higher than what's legal now in Washington State where the cutoff is, is 80 milligrams percent or 0 0.08, and so this is, is really drunk. So the percent of drivers at peak time, peak drinking time, weekend nights, was 11% in Ghana, 11% dangerously drunk, which is considerably higher than uh, the results from similar studies in the United States, especially recently where there's been more attention to the problem. And even more frightening, if you weren't frightened enough to drive in, in, or be on the road in Ghana, especially at night, uh, is the 24-hour, seven-day-a-week averages, uh, this is peak time, this is everything, mornings, evenings, all averaged together, 3% of bus drivers were intoxicated and 8% of truck drivers. So if you're traveling on the Accra Kumasi Road or similar roads around the world, that means that one out of 12 times that a vehicle like this comes barreling down the road on the other side, one out of 12 times the driver is dangerously drunk. Many other times they're just a little bit drunk. This is the 12%, 8% or one out of 12 dangerously drunk, which is probably um, uh, in part why you see scenes like this all up and down the roadways of the world. Well, what to do with this kind of information? Publishing it in scientific venues is only part of the picture. Such inf information needs to be used for real results, and Dr. Aziema uh, wrote editorials about it, uh, this coming from the uh, uh, Daily Graphic, Ghana's leading newspaper. He presented it to his political leaders, and the study was one piece of information which helped to get the Ghana parliament to pass a law establishing 0.08 as a cutoff for drunk driving, which was the first time an actual blood alcohol concentration had been specified in law in that country. Well, there's still a long way to go in terms of enforcement, but at least it's a step. And before getting into one of the other major behavioral risk factors, speed, vehicle speed, let me uh, put this in context, not only for vehicle occupants, but also for pedestrians who are part of a broader group called vulnerable road users, including motorcyclists, bicyclists, and pedestrians. Globally, these account for about half of all traffic fatalities, which is a, a significant difference between the pattern in high-income countries where it's mostly vehicle occupants. That is, in the United States, it's only about 10% of traffic fatalities are pedestrians. So the, the protection of vulnerable road users becomes much more important uh, in low- and middle-income countries. 
And in dealing with pedestrian safety, there's an unfortunate tendency to blame pedestrians for being hit, that is, they weren't careful crossing the street, et cetera. Well, in fact, there's a complex interplay of factors that lead to high rates of pedestrian injuries globally, such as a mix of different road users. This is from uh, New Delhi. Um, uh, different road users all vying for the same space uh, and using the same space, but at different speeds. There's also, uh, this is from Latin America, similar uh, complex mix of road users. Uh, there's also, uh, uh, even if people are aware of dangers, there's a need to, to earn your daily living for many people on the streets uh, and thus be exposed to traffic and risk of, of pedestrian injury. And there's an effect of social hierarchy, income, and rights that come into play here, as they do for so many public health issues, whether here or globally. Those injured as vulnerable road users tend to be from lower socioeconomic strata than those driving, or even those traveling within vehicles. And this plays out more broadly, because safety for pedestrians is even more neglected than safety for vehicle occupants. All of this is even further complicated by the fact that the solution to pedestrian injuries primarily involves long-term infrastructural changes. For example, changing situations like this, where settlements or ur uh, urban, uh, uh, however people are distributed, where, where they live and where they go to school or work, and a situation like this where people have to cross streets frequently is inherently more dangerous than one in which high-speed roads bypass or go around uh, populated areas. There's also roles for other infrastructural changes, such as separation of, of uh, uh, road users. And this is an ideal situation here where pedestrians are separated from bicyclists, are separated from motor transport. This is inherently much safer than something like this. There's also a role uh, when uh, users can't be separated, there's a role to make sure that of, make, of, of uh, infrastructural changes. They make sure that vehicles go slower, such as speed bumps or these devices called chicanes, which uh, make it uh, so that vehicles are forced to slow down, uh, otherwise they'd hit them. And this, these type traffic calming devices are important because they lower one of the main determinants of death for pedestrians. That is, the speed with which a vehicle hits you. And uh, if vehicle speeds can be kept low, in this, you know, according to this graph, uh, less than 30 kilometers per hour, the risk of death is fairly low. Once you start getting above 50, 60 kilometers per hour, the risk of death to a pedestrian skyrockets up to nearly 100%. So a critical part of assuring safety of pedestrians is keeping vehicle speeds lower when they're in areas where there's a lot of pedestrians. And I would like to, to describe a uh, small, but I think significant success story on the part of one of our UW Fogarty graduates, James Damsiri Derry, who was a research officer at the Building and Roads Research Institute in Kumasi as part of the Ministry of Transport, and uh, was a UW Fogarty scholar getting an MPH degree here a couple of years ago. And his uh, project, uh, he measured uh, vehicle speeds with a radar uh, gun on 20,000 vehicles. Uh, and this shows uh, one part of that, which is vehicles traveling through small towns and villages on the Accra Kumasi Road. These are places where the uh, road is, is otherwise unregulated in speed, ve uh, vehicles going very fast, and then all of a sudden they enter the periphery of a town or village. And usually there's a, a sign, uh, faded, rusty, l tilting to the side, that says speed limit 50 kilometers per hour, which is widely ignored. Uh, and this, this shows that speed limit, 50 kilometers per hour, and this shows the distribution of vehicle speeds. And you can see that very few vehicles are following and obeying the speed limit. And those that are probably aren't doing it voluntarily. They're probably so dilapidated that they just can't go faster than 50 kilometers per hour. And uh, the mean speed, somewhere around twice the speed limit. And some even going three times the speed limit. This is once again through uh, villages and towns with a lot of pedestrians kids also crossing the roads. Well, in a, what, I, what I think is a very uh, uh, excellent example of the public health model combining advocacy and uh, science, uh, James went on to public, and others in the Building and Roads Research Institute, went on to publicize this, articles in newspapers, press conference, and FM radio stations. Um, Ghana is very interesting, and I imagine many other countries are like this, but there's a very active network of talk shows. 
And uh, James appeared on many of these, uh, uh, stressing the importance of speed control, which was the first time, really, that speed control had been talked about on talk radio. Uh, I don't even think we do that in America. I'd have to get Rush Limbaugh interested in the topic. <laughs> and um, this uh, had a, a fairly significant result in building political, popular and political will to implement. Uh, the Building and Roads Research Institute had been trying for years to put speed bumps in some of the more dangerous locations on the roadways in Ghana and had met with a lot of apathy, lack of budget, opposition to this. But eventually, mostly in large part because of James's advocacy, this became much more um, palatable and much more supported. And uh, there's now an in, uh, a significant increase in the number of such locations on this one road, other, other roadways also, but in particular this one road connecting the two biggest cities in Ghana, the road that has the uh, most traffic. Um, and uh, this increased number of uh, traffic calming devices along Ghana's roadways uh, has proven effective, uh, at least at the one site where it's been evaluated, this one particular uh, junction which had a lot of pedestrian injuries, and there's been a decrease in number of crashes and a decrease in the number of fatalities because of these simple uh, infrastructural changes. And I mentioned the socioeconomic issues in road safety, which come into play as with many other health problems. And we have, this has ramifications even for something as basic as speed bumps. These annoy many motorists who would prefer to travel faster. There's been pressure to remove these. In essence, there's a conflict, which plays out in many countries, a conflict between the desire for mobility, which is by the slightly more affluent who are able to travel in vehicles, and the right to safety of those living in the in towns and villages through which the roads passed, who are typically in a lower socioeconomic strata. And up until now, pressure to remove these improvements has been resisted by road authorities who realize their value in part because of the politicalization and, and advocacy by James and others at the BRRI. And this is aided by the fact that people in the communities are increasingly realizing their value. Uh, when I was last in Ghana a few uh, months ago, I had asked uh, James's uh, boss, Francis Afrukar, uh, about whether uh, the pressure to remove these was, was becoming overbearing and, and w was it being successful. And he replied that no, in fact, uh, there's more and more demand for these in more towns. Now people in the towns along the roads are demanding these. In other words, they're demanding their right to safety and they're not tolerating that their kids uh, should that the kids' lives should be put at risk by the high-speed highways that pass through their towns. Well, similar principles apply to many other types of injuries, uh, unintentional injuries, and it also applies to intentional injuries, violence and suicide. Overall, our understanding of how, the, um, how to prevent violence and suicide is less well advanced than for intentional injuries. However, much can still be done. Confronting violence involves several parts of societies. Traditionally, it's involved the criminal justice sector, uh, but increasingly it's involving the health sector, the public health sector with its approach that character is characterized by emphasis on prevention rather than accepting or reacting to violence. My colleagues back at WHO have been at the forefront of this with two sentinel works, the War Report on Violence and Health, which um, it um, details injuries toll globally, and more recently, uh, a summary of the evidence on public health type interventions to confront violence. Shown here is a table from that book summarizing some of the evidence. Um, and um, it's difficult to take on all of violence at once, but rather interventions are targeted against some subtypes, such as child maltreatment or child abuse, intimate partner violence or domestic violence, sexual violence, youth violence, elder abuse, and suicide. The uh, open circles represent emerging evidence, of which there's a lot, and the uh, solid uh, circles represent uh, solid evidence, of which there's only a little. And most of the solid evidence comes from one field, intimate partner violence. Um, uh, and some of the proven interventions, for example, uh, victim identification and support programs, such as women's shelters, that is, uh, removing victims from potentially, uh, removing potential victims from abusive and dangerous uh, environments. Uh, and most of this evidence comes from high-income countries. But there is some growing evidence 
uh, for uh, effectiveness of such measures in low and middle income countries. And I would like to give one example of how these principles play out in one particular scenario. In some countries, a form of violence whereby acid is thrown onto someone's face in an effort to disfigure her or him has become tragically common. Globally, different scenarios are involved in terms of who are perpetrators and victims. In Bangladesh, acid attacks are most often against women, and perpetrators are usually their uh, male partners or suitors. Too often, the attack has its intended consequence of leaving the victim disfigured and thus socially excluded. The attacks need to be viewed in the wider context of gender discrimination and disempowerment of women, wherein perpetrators feel there's little chance that they'll be punished for their crime. To combat this, Monira Rahman and others founded the Acid Survivors Foundation in 1999. Their goals are to help victims across the board, medically, socially, legally, financially, to promote their reintegration back into society, and to prevent and hopefully eliminate such attacks, which is what I want to uh, concentrate on. Uh, ASF has specific activities, uh, has engaged in several activities to try to prevent acid violence, including lobbying government, um, to make decision makers aware of the extent of the problem, and to motivate them to increase government action to stop it. These uh, particular acts, uh, increase the certainty and swiftness of prosecution of perpetrators. The acts also address a host of other legal issues like compensation for victims, duties of investigating officers, medical testimony, and severity of penalties. The acts also sought to better regulate the availability of acid and set up a monitoring system for the number of attacks. Despite the laws, many victims still shy away from bringing legal action against perpetrators and ASF has a legal wing to assist victims in taking on the prolonged and often difficult proceedings. They encourage police and prosecutors to fulfill their duties and attempt to fill gaps. For example, one gap has been the reluctance of doctors to provide expert testimony. ASF has attempted to fill that gap by uh, providing logistic support and financial remuneration for doctors to be able to travel to trials uh, to provide that ex expert testimony. And ASF also provides short-term shelters for victims who are being threatened by their perpetrators, uh, pressuring them to drop the charges. ASF has undertaken a wide range of public information activities to change attitudes to make acid violence unacceptable. Uh, this has included mass advertising, public dramas, uh, press conferences, and establishing a media award for journalists who cover this problem. Well, is this, from the public health viewpoint, is this this is not a randomized control trial. Is this something we should support? Suppose you were at WHO and you're in your office there on the sixth floor, and you got a call from the Ministry of Health of Pakistan or India or somewhere else, and they said, uh, we're having a growing problem with acid violence in our country, and what do you, WHO, recommend? We've been hearing about this program in Bangladesh. Is that something you think we should do? Ah, great. A cornerstone of public health is monitoring results. And this, this isn't from randomized control trials, but indeed part of the Acid Control Act of uh, 2002 was to set up a monitoring system in Bangladesh. And this is police reported uh, acid violence, so it's probably underreporting the extent of the problem. But nonetheless, uh, there's been, since the ASF got underway, there's been a steady decrease, 10, 15, 20 percent per year in rates of acid violence. And you would imagine with better reporting, it would be capturing more results as time wore on, so the decrease is most likely real. Well, can we prove that this was due to the work of the ASF? Probably not, I'm not sure. Do we have enough suspicion that we should go ahead and encourage similar work in other countries? I would think so. And um, in fact, um, the work of the ASF in Bangladesh has stimulated similar efforts in other countries including Cambodia, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Uganda. So, injury prevention can be used for a host of scenarios, both unintentional and intentional injuries. And we also have to look at the next point on the spectrum of injury control is how to improve care of victims, both in the pre-hospital setting and in hospital-based care, both acute care and rehabilitation. 
Well, let's start by asking the question, would any lives be saved by improving trauma care in low and middle income countries? Is this anything we should pay attention to? To answer this question, let's look at existing discrepancies in outcome by region of the world. This study looked at the percent of seriously injured persons defined by trauma surgery standards fairly precisely, injury severity scores of nine or more, which means injuries with a significant threat to life. And the uh, percent of people who died from such injuries rose from about a third in a high income environment to about a half in a middle income environment to about two thirds in a low income environment. That is, in a low income environment, you're about twice as likely to die from the same injuries as you would be in a high income environment. To the extent that these uh, differences are reflective of differences more globally in other countries of similar economic levels, if we could eliminate these inequities and decrease the case these case fatality rates in low and middle income countries to the rates prevalent here in high income countries, we estimate we could save about 2 million out of the nearly 6 million people who die each year from injuries. This is by improvements in treatment for people already injured in addition to whatever might be um, uh, added by uh, road safety and other prevention. In addition, there's a, a large burden of disability, uh, much of it in developing countries due to extremity-related injuries, and the outcome of these are eminently amenable to improvements in orthopedic care and rehabilitation. Such discrepancies in outcome between high, and, and low, uh, high, high income and low and middle income countries are due to a number of problems, such as logarithmic differences in the availability of several categories of health workers, such as surgeons, and this would be true for many other providers, lack of physical resources, equipment, and supplies, sometimes lack of, of critical items, even if they're low cost, due to mostly to problems with organization, planning, and procurement. And even when resources are adequate, there are often deficiencies in the process of care. One study from the Comfort Fibonacci Hospital found prolonged time to emergency surgery, a uh, quite notable average of 12 hours, and low utilization of many treatment modalities, even though they were physically present. The, uh, the study uh, ended with a call for greater use, uh, better monitoring of trauma care globally, greater use of, of uh, simple quality improvement programs to address many such problems comprehensively. Now, obviously, part of the problem is economic restrictions, poverty with very minimal sums available for health as you go from high to middle to low income. But despite these limitations, improvements are possible, and I would like to give a few examples. In Mexico, increased number of sites of ambulance dispatch and improved training uh, for uh, ambulance attendants resulted in a, a decrease in mortality among uh, patients tr uh, transported by the ambulance service there in the city of Monterey. This was at an affordable price uh, that subsequently has been continued by that city's government. And even in settings where there's no formal ambulance services, which is mo most of the world, the average uh, uh, ambulance services don't uh, reach most of the world. The average person in the world doesn't have any hope that an ambulance will come for them uh, if they're injured. But in that scenario, uh, improvements are still possible. And often this involves building on existing, though informal, patterns of pre-hospital care. For example, in Ghana, if injured persons are brought to a hospital, they're usually brought by a taxi or bus driver. And one program there that involves several groups, including the uh, uh, Ghana Red Cross and the Ghana Private Road Transport Union, the uh, equivalent of the Teamsters Union for Ghana, uh, engaged in a uh, program to provide first aid training for several hundred drivers. And a follow-up of that revealed that most of them actually used the training. It wasn't academic. Most of them did, use the, did, you, did uh, employ first aid uh, in the care and transport of injured persons after the training, in the year after the training, with a notable increase in appropriate first aid measures for the people they transported. In an even um, uh, more noteworthy program uh, focused on remote landmine infested areas in northern Iraq and Cambodia, and in these locations, one innovative program uh, engaged in fir widespread first aid training for fir lay f uh, several thousand lay first responders, villagers who would volunteer to, to, to serve this role in their communities. And uh, with uh, training also for a smaller number of more highly trained paramedics. Uh, this uh, had a dramatic effect on mortality of mind blast victims and victims of other forms of trauma in uh, those areas. A very significant uh, change with a very low cost program. 
In terms of hospital care, there are uh, many good examples. I just showed just one. There are loads of examples that could be shown. In this particular location of Konkin, Thailand, a trauma quality improvement program at one of the major hospitals that cares for injured people there, monitored and detected a high rate of preventable deaths. These are medically preventable deaths. And undertook corrective, uh, found corrective uh, problems that should be imminently correctable, inadequate resuscitation for shock, delayed surgery for head injuries and undertook corrective action, very low cost, improved communication within the hospital to alert, for example, neurosurgeons when head injuries, when their services were needed, senior staffing at peak times in the emergency department to assure better resuscitation of shock as carried out by more junior uh, staff, and improved record keeping and monitoring. And this resulted in a decrease in mortality for all admitted patients, all very uh, simple administrative, better organization planning at low cost. Well, the question becomes, and, and then many similar examples from institutions around the world could be cited. The question becomes how to make more progress globally. And there are several possible avenues to pursue, and I would like to just comment briefly on some of the work uh, that I engaged in with others at the World Health Organization, in particular the department I used to work in there, Violence and Injury Prevention. And this has produced several normative or guidance documents defining basic essential services in both pre-hospital and hospital settings that WHO feels could be assured to all injured persons, even in the lowest uh, income settings. For example, pre-hospital trauma care systems uh, gives guidance to governments as to how to implement simple uh, ambulance services or make better use of first responders, uh, as was done in the example of northern Iraq and Cambodia. Similar recommendations uh, were developed for hospital care by a collaborative working group of WHO staff and members of the uh, International Society of Surgery. I was very privileged to serve as chair of that working group. And aside from accomplishing our main goals, uh, you can see that we also get better at photography. This being the same group of people standing in the same place two years apart on the roof of the WHO. We uh, sought to apply the principles of public health to trauma care. Uh, which uh, people on both sides of the spectrum, public health and trauma, uh, really kind of thought was nuts, but I think uh, time has uh, proven this to be a good concept. And, and similar in fashion to what those involved with safe motherhood have been doing for a much longer period of time, trying to make uh, better access to emergency obstetrical care. So these guidelines lay out a core minimum essential set of services that we feel every person injured in the world has a right to, and I show just a few of these. These are very straightforward medically, and the reason to state them so explicitly is that currently the majority of injured people in the world do not receive these services, and we feel they can and should. There's, uh, behind, to assure the availability of these uh, basic services, the guidelines go on to give many technical details, which I won't go into, but there's like 200 individual items of, of human resources, skills, training, staffing, and uh, physical resources, equipment, and supplies that are designated as either E for essential or D for desirable at the spectrum of healthcare facilities going from small rural clinics up to tertiary care centers. And just to give some general examples of what we've been trying to promote with this, this uh, program, uh, we're trying to promote that rural clinics that care for injured people should have capabilities for rapid basic first aid, which many do not. And although we usually think of trauma care as something that goes on in ambulance services and in hospitals, it's important to note that in rural areas of low-income countries, much of the care of the injured, even seriously injured, goes on in facilities such as this. Smaller uh, hospitals, district hospitals, should have capabilities for minimum blood transfusion capabilities and uh, uh, be able to insert chest tubes and engage in basic airway measurements, uh, maintenance. Uh, this, by the way, is a chest tube, uh, which is a very low-cost item, vital, but still critically important for the treatment of life-threatening chest injuries, often absent, even though it's so low-cost. This also, by the way, is the operating room at the Holy Family Hospital in Brekum, Ghana, where I used to work. And we're trying to promote that large hospitals should have very basic facilities uh, befitting their size, such as rapid ability to undertake endotracheal intubation uh, on an emergency basis, which is currently problematic in many such institutions and basic quality improvement programs, which are virtually non-existent. Uh, similar recommendations pertain to middle-income environments, but with greater emphasis on desirable uh, elements, more higher-cost items. Um, 
these guidelines are intended to be part planning guide uh, and to be part advocacy statement to really push for improvements on the ground. And this has been happening and these and several other countries, the guidelines have been used by Ministry of Health planners and have received considerable political endorsement. It has also served as the first internationally applicable standard to use in assessing trauma care um, and the resources for trauma care. Needs assessments using the guidelines for central trauma care have now been undertaken in over 10 countries, with findings of some being used as a stimulus for action uh, with documented improvements, as was the case in the work of Sun Nguyen uh, in the network of hospitals serving the Hanoi area. So as regards trauma care, there's a lot that can be done to decrease mortality and prevent disability affordably and sustainably. In fact, many trauma-related interventions are among the most cost-effective in the healthcare armamentarium. The Disease Control Priorities Project ranks health interventions by their cost-effectiveness. This slide shows a summary table from that project. In fact, I only show part of one of the, the, the large tables from that publication, the 30 most cost-effective interventions that it ranked. Uh, ranked as with most cost-effective towards the bottom uh, and cost-effectiveness judged as dollars needed to revert one disability-adjusted life year lost. So very cost-effective would be things that only cost one to 10 to $100 per life year, uh, disability-adjusted life year averted and things that are less cost effective are those that cost in the thousands or 10,000s. And um, uh, some of the uh, things that I've been talking about in, uh, on the trauma care part of this talk are among the most cost effective in the armamentarium of, of health interventions, surgery at the district hospital, basic ambulance services, and use of lay village first responders for first aid in the field. In fact, this particular element, uh, use of lay, uh, uh, emergency care training for volunteer medics, uh, paramedics uh, with lay first responders uh, is very similar to what I had mentioned in the program from uh, northern Iraq and Cambodia. And uh, this is second in cost effectiveness only to basic hygiene. So a lot can certainly be done at a low cost, very feasibly and sustainably to improve care for injured people in addition to prevention. So you're probably wondering, have we come at last, Charlie, to the intolerable part of your talk? Or in fact, has, have you already been in the intolerable part of the talk? I would like to finish with a quote from Sir Geoffrey Vickers, a British lawyer who uh, uh, was engaged in a lot of public health activities in uh, England uh, in the first half of the, century, of the last century. And he wrote in an editorial in Lancet uh, in March 1958, uh, what sets the goals of public health? And a, a, a great quote, I think, from that article was, the landmarks of political, economic, and social history are the moments when some condition passed from the category of the given into the category of the intolerable. And uh, that's my bolding. Uh, the history of public health might well be written as a record of the successive redefinings of the unacceptable. I wish I could write like that. Well, uh, just a few, I think this really hits the nail on the head of much of what we're trying to do in public health. Just a few brief examples. One of the sentinel achievements of public health in the late 19th, uh, uh, 19th century, early 20th century, water and sanitation. In most industrialized countries, we now have a situation where everyone, people, government, would not tolerate anything else other than a very good sanitation system. Can you imagine the uproar we'd have in Seattle if we had an outbreak of cholera? but yet we tolerate 30,000 deaths on the roadway every year in our country. More recently, an achievement that clearly fits this definition of making something intolerable is the work of HIV AIDS activists to, who sought and have partially succeeded in making it intolerable that the majority of people with HIV AIDS in the world would not have access to a simple low cost treatment that would save their lives, antiretroviral therapy. There's still a lot to accomplish, but a lot has been achieved in making that situation intolerable. And I know that some here at UW have been very active in this, including, I think, some members of the audience. We in the injury field are trying to follow in your footsteps. For example, Candace Leitner, who founded Mothers Against Drunk Driving after her daughter, her 13-year-old daughter, daughter, had been killed by a drunk driver. She has devoted her life to trying to make it so that drunk driving is not tolerated in our country or anywhere else. 
Or perhaps better stated, she's trying to make it so none of us would tolerate ourselves making the decision to drive drunk and thus put other people's lives at risk. Monira Rahman, who is trying to make it intolerable that women in Bangladesh should have acid thrown in their faces and have their lives ruined. My colleagues back in Ghana, Justice Amagashi, nicknamed the Apostle of Road Safety in Ghana, Noble Appiah, the head of the National Air Safety Commission, and our UW Fogarty scholar, James Dampsery Derry, have worked and devoted much of their lives to trying to make it intolerable in Ghana that these children should have to risk their lives every day by crossing deadly high-speed roads that cut through the middle of their towns and villages when simple, simple low-cost measures such as these speed bumps would protect them. And in our own small way, myself and my colleagues, who are trying to make it intolerable that severely injured persons from around the world should be taken to emergency rooms such as this or operating rooms such as this and die because, or become crippled because some simple elements of trauma care are not available, simple treatments that are eminently feasible even in locations such as this. Well, in conclusion, I hope I've managed to convince you of what I started out at the beginning. Uh, that is that injury is a huge global health problem, that much can be done affordably and sustainably to prevent it and uh, to improve its treatment, and that it deserves much more attention, and that it deserves to be much more part of the global health agenda. So thank you very much uh, for being invited to speak to the Washington Global Health Alliance, and uh, I think we might have time for a question or two. If not, then um, outside perhaps. So thank you.